Uh, good afternoon, all, and uh, welcome to the GSD. We're so happy to see you here for the uh, open house, which is our, um, our warm and welcoming form of hospitality, and to tell you about our school. And as part of that program, uh, we have this panel this afternoon that's been named Pedagogy and Practice, and it serves a dual function. One is to introduce three of um, my uh, rather extraordinary uh, colleagues, I'm very proud to call colleagues, and uh, that's Neil Brenner, who's a professor of urban history, uh, Gary Hildebrand, who's a professor in practice of landscape architecture and a principal at Reed Hildebrand, and uh, Beth Whitaker, who's a, uh, also a, a professor of practice of architecture and a founding principal at uh, Merge Architects. Now, I want to make two quick prefatory uh, framing comments. Um, the second having to do with pedagogy and practice, but the first having to do with the panel itself. And uh, it brings to mind something my son said to me the other day, my son, the aspiring Pythagoras. He said, Dad, it's interesting that um, uh, pizza comes in a round pie, put in a square box, and cut into triangular slices. And um, I, I like that because in the context of today having an urbanist or someone interested in urban issues, um, a landscape architect, and an architect, it, it, it brought to mind what it is we do uh, in this uh, building uh, uh, beneath this um, glass canopied roof and the way these disciplines come together and interact in uh, uh, very compelling ways. And uh, I wouldn't want to force any boundaries between these three disciplines, but rather suggest the way they, um, they are involved in all sorts of uh, fascinating uh, interlocutions. And finally, to continue with the pizza metaphor, if you're wondering about my own role in this world, I teach on the history theory side of things. Um, and I like to think of history theory as a kind of tripodal table-like thing that comes in the pizza box. Uh, in fact, they're called package savers, uh, and it keeps the gooey stuff from sticking to the box. And uh, that's what history theory does, uh, pure and simple. Um, look. Um, I, by way of uh, describing or discussing uh, pedagogy and practice, and what's going to happen is I'm going to invite my uh, colleagues up in a minute and they'll uh, present their work and then we'll gather in a, uh, uh, a panel discussion. But I wanted to take on these uh, terms. I'm not going to uh, address directly the meaning or use or perhaps misuse of the terms pedagogy and practice, much less their origin, as I am fairly well convinced that many, if not most, in fact, Indeed, all etymologies are false and misleading, which is why they're so much fun to engage in. And uh, in fact, give the, uh, the panelists the opportunity to, to define practice and pedagogy in their own way. Rather, I want to suggest very quickly how pedagogy and practice are related. And for my students in the uh, landscape architecture um, history sequence who just sat through a lecture of mine on how the landscape is produced with uh, prepositions, i.e. above, below, before, after, to and from, the approach I'm about to take should be familiar. So I address the and, pedagogy and practice. And, as you know, is a uh, coordinating conjunction. It adds together things or clauses or statements of the same rank. There's no bias. Um, it is just that. They're additive in nature, pedagogy and practice. But we might ask how pedagogy and practice become cumulative, in a sense, if not successive. Um, in, so in as much as and is a conjunction, and keep in mind, and more recently, and has become a noun. And as you will learn when you uh, enter the program and study computer programming languages, and is now a, a Boolean operator. But about that, I can say absolutely nothing more than that. Um, uh, let's look at another conjunction, or. You could say pedagogy and practice. There's another uh, strife or possible tension, pedagogy or practice, or practice or pedagogy, how one might disallow the other. And clearly what we're going to talk about today is uh, foreclosing that sad possibility, or is also uh, a correlative. Um, is it pedagogy or practice, either practice or pedagogy, neither practice nor pedagogy? Uh, these are correlative, uh, of, which involve some type of causation or subordination. But the most interesting case um, for us to make is uh, perhaps pedagogy as practice, okay? which is, I think, something that probably happens in this school, or practice as pedagogy. 
And as is a much more elastic term. It, it's a more practical term. It can be used as conjunction, a preposition, or an adverb, depending on context. And all the disciplines we are involved in uh, are both context-based and context-producing. It can be used as, con as a conjunction. The student learned as the teacher practiced. A preposition, where it refers to the function a person occupies. She practices as a pedagogue. Or as an adverb, where it shows comparison or uh, equivalence. Pedagogy is as inventive as practice. And you can substitute for inventive grueling, revealing, constraining, tiring, et cetera. So what we do in, uh, within the, uh, and beyond the uh, GSD, and here's those prepositions again, with regard to pedagogy and practice is what we're here to discuss today. And if I can give one final gloss to this, I want to suggest a particular usage of the word um, as. And this is in the formulation of um, the German uh, philosopher Hans uh, Wachinger. And for you history theory types, he was a specialist in Kant, who's frequently mentioned in this very room in the BTC sequence. But in any case, Wachinger wrote a book uh, called The Philosophy of As If. And we can interrogate the part of speech of if in a second. And this book was published in 1911. And some of you might be thinking that was the same year as Frederick Wills Winslow Taylor's um, Principles of Scientific Management, which is telling, although Weinger's book was composed, in fact, decades earlier. But um, in talking about the as if, um, we're talking about a type of, um, of operation, not a Boolean operation, it's up such, but operative fictions, and this is what Weihinger was interested in, of thinking and acting as if the world were like our reasonable mental, mental constructions of it, because what else do we have to go by? That's what we work with, that's what we work on. Thought, Weihinger said, is a um, instrument in the service of life, and these instruments take the form of useful fictions, as if compelling fictions, fully rendered fictions. Um, uh, while what we do in uh, pedagogy and practice here in the GSD is largely interrogating the fiction of our own um, renderings as such. So I don't mean to get all philosophical with this, which is really not my strong suit by any means, but I wanted to open up a space in which we can put together pedagogy and practice without narrowly defining them uh, from the outset. And in the uh, presentations we're about to hear um, and the conversation I hope to stimulate, uh, think about these possibilities of pedagogy and practice, pedagogy as practice, or the as if of pedagogy where it gives rise to practice or uh, the reverse case. So with that, um, let me uh, introduce uh, my first speaker, who is uh, Neil Brenner, as I said, um, who's a professor of urban theory, a, a prolific and um, quite influential uh, writer uh, in this field who engages our students um, in the seminar room, principally. Is that a fair statement? No. Elaborate. Yeah. That, but that's a point of contention. So one of the issues I want to address later is um, where this pedagogy and practice takes place, whether it's classroom, lecture hall, studio, office, on-site, off-site, because these to me are, um, are important framing devices for how we think about what we do as practitioners and pedagogues. So um, from beyond the center. I just teach a lot of lecture classes. That's, that's the only corrective. So um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the GSD. Um, it's great to have everyone here for the open house. Um, what I want to do is actually reflect on the role of theory in pedagogy and practice at the GSD. And I'm someone who um, believes very passionately, very strongly, that theory is essential to every dimension of pedagogy and practice. And so I want to explain why I think that and, and the implications of that particular proposition. So I teach, wait, let me get this going right. There we go. I teach a lot of theory classes, and I've been doing this for a while, and I, rec I encounter in doing that a lot of resistance. And when I encounter that resistance, I reflect on it and try to make sense of 
what is this resistance to theory? And I have a lot to say about that topic, but for the moment, I would boil down the resistance to theory to two basic orientations. The first one is the orientation towards practice. So I put what is to be done by Lenin, but there are many other versions of it. The idea that basically there are urgent matters in the world that we need to confront immediately, and theory is a luxury that prevents us from getting down to the business of confronting those challenges. That's a position that I'm very sympathetic to in some ways. But there's a second form of resistance to theory that currently is experience. This is really hard to push. Hang on. There we go. A second form of resistance to theory that is currently experiencing a certain kind of um, renaissance. And I would describe that as a kind of um, big data geoscience orientation. This is from a magazine article in Wired a couple years ago, the end of theory, and basically arguing that with the rise of big data, and we could also add to that the rise of new technical capacities for mapping many layers of the world, that theory is now irrelevant or obsolete. We don't need theory because we have technological capacities to analyze all kinds of processes and regularities without bothering with it. So I fundamentally reject both of those positions. I think both of those positions are not only wrong, but in some ways misleading and dangerous. And so I want to offer three opposing or opening, well, opening and opposing propositions for why theory matters both to pedagogy and practice in all of the design disciplines. First proposition, I want to argue that theory is a basis for deciphering life. It's not opposed to the realm of history or practice, but indeed it is the only basis on which we can decipher practice and history. Um, the question is not whether or not to engage with theory, but how reflexive we're going to be about the theories that we always already presuppose in thought and in action. Second proposition. Interpretations, I want to argue, that is to say theories, shape the production of space. So every key concept, I would argue, in the design disciplines, in architecture and planning, has a contested history, and the meaning of those concepts change over time. And furthermore, the changes in those meanings of interpretations have real material effects. So the way we interpret the world, the way we interpret the built environment, the unbuilt environment, has massive implications for what we can do, for how we even conceive the possible of what we might do. So theory, in that sense, is not disconnected from practice. It's an always already present dimension of practice. And thirdly, I would argue that theory actively animates political values and struggles. It's connected, in other words, to normative thinking, the struggle for the good life, the struggle for justice, the struggle for sustainability, and any other values, equality, that we might consider important. So there's a, a philosopher of planning named Bent Fluvberg who, who builds on Aristotle's distinction between techne, epistem, and phronesis that I think is quite relevant here. So techne is technical, instrumental knowledge. Epistem is scientific knowledge, the search for causes. And phronesis is practical wisdom, reflection on the norms and values that render the world meaningful. And I want to argue theory is actually relevant to all of those, but it's particularly relevant to this question of phrenesis. And as such, without theory, the design disciplines are going to be extremely disoriented. We need to be reflexive about all of the dimensions, all of the theoretical interpretations, normative and otherwise, that we're presupposing. So that's a very general commitment that I would elaborate in relation to a variety of different fields of design practice and design scholarship. But what I want to do with, um, with my uh, presentation here is just try to concretize some of those general arguments with reference to the specific field that I spend all my time working in, which is urban theory, and basically reporting on the work that we've been doing in the, the urban theory lab here at the, um, the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So the urban theory lab, our core question of pretty much all of the work, both abstract, visual, and concrete that we do, is to ask the question of whether inherited frameworks for thinking about mapping and influencing the urban are, in fact, adequate to, to contemporary transformations in the world. So in this sense, theory is both a starting point for our work and a goal. So we start with theory because we're trying to reflexively interrogate the theoretical assumptions that inhere within all different frameworks of urban scholarship and action. 
But at the same time, it's a goal because part of our agenda in the work that we're doing is to try to invent new theoretical frameworks that might more adequately enable us to understand, to map, and to influence urbanization processes that are rapidly kind of ricocheting around the world. So to illustrate this idea, I'm just going to interrogate, critically reflect on, in some ways, what I think is one of the dominant theoretical meta-narratives of our time. And it's a pretty simple idea. It's just the idea that um, we live in an urban world. So we hear that all the time. It's usually connected to the claim that 50% of the world's population now lives within cities. And as I'll explain in just a moment, there are many other versions of that proposition. But the notion of we live in an urban world, in some ways, I think it's fair to say we all pretty much take it for granted. But I want to ask the question, building on this kind of reflexive orientation that I've just developed, in what sense is it really the case that the world is ermine? So the dominant spatial imagination through which this question is approached is the idea of the city. And there are many different interpretations of this condition of the city. And there are many different spatial representations of that condition. So it's usually um, in the mainstream definitions dots on a map, which are configured according to the size of populations. This is from the United Nations. And that's often connected to the proposition I mentioned a moment ago that we live in a majority urban world because more than 50% of the world's population now lives within cities. That's also from the United Nations. And it's repeated far and wide. And it's basically premised upon this notion of a kind of urban-rural divide. All space in the world is either, you've got two choices. It's either urban or rural. And the, the fundamental kind of empirical question is counting population, deciding which settlements are cities and which aren't, and then figuring out the distribution. So it's a kind of distributional model. And the urban age, in this sense, is simply the sands in the hourglass moving from the rural side of the hourglass to the urban side. Obviously, there are more sands in the hourglass that are constantly being added because the world's population is growing. So that's one dominant version. <clears throat> that's one dominant version of this. The world has become urban narrative. Another important version is a more economic version. So dots, but now connected by lines. So this is from John Friedman's model of the global city system in 1986. The idea that global cities are the nodes of command and control of the world economy. So it's not just city population, but it's connections between cities that engender the economic importance of cities. And yet another visualization of the same thing from Richard Florida and others is this idea, very powerful in many ways, of a spiky world. So what Richard Florida is arguing here is simply that the majority of national GDP is produced within the big, dense settlements that we call cities. And yet another version of the same thing is the kind of obsessive concern of many governments and international organizations to come up with world city rankings. And there's probably like 100 different methodologies out there for ranking world cities, embodying the idea of a hierarchical system of power among cities in the world. But all of these positions, and there are a few other versions of it. There's an environmental version. But for the moment, the point is simply this, that all of these different positions, whether population-based, economic, or environmental, they converge around what I would argue is not just an empirical position, but a fundamental, fundamentally theoretical and interpretive one, which is that we live in an urban world because we live in a world of cities. Um, city populations, city economic life, city environmental strategy. And I want to argue that this is not simply an empirical claim. There are many empirical dimensions to the claim, but it's not purely empirical. It rests upon a number of underlying interpretive spatial assumptions that, um, in fact, are highly problematic, I want to argue. So first of all, what are the theoretical assumptions that underpin these different widely taken for granted meta narratives? So first of all, the notion that the city is a settlement type, which is distinct from other settlement types, suburban, rural, wilderness, and so forth. Secondly, the assumption that the city is spatially bounded, that there's a clear separation of these units from a putatively non-city or non-urban outside. And thirdly, it's in some ways a very crude and totalizing view, because the model of the urban world in these, in these approaches implies that these city-like units are effectively replicated across the entire territory. So settlement type, spatially bounded, and universally replicated. 
So in our work in the Urban Theory Lab, in my scholarly work and in my teaching, I'm doing a lot of, um, making a lot of effort to critically interrogate this assumption or this set of assumptions based on the idea that today the urban has exploded and that the, the inherited set of assumptions, spatially and otherwise, that we use, that we traditionally use in scholarship and indeed in the design and planning disciplines to think the urban need to be radically reinvented. So once again, I've got three propositions for you. So the first one is that instead of working with this universal notion of the city, I think it's more productive to differentiate and diversify the notion of agglomeration. There are many spatial forms of agglomeration. There are many political forms of agglomeration. And agglomeration occurs at many spatial scales. And in contrast to what many economic geographers and economists currently argue, I would argue there are many causes of agglomeration. The search for a universal theory of agglomeration, which goes back about a century, is arguably misguided. So there is no, from this point of view, there is no single form of the city. So the Chicago schools, dartboard model, Gottman's famous territorial extension of the urban. If you look at density maps of the Ganges Plain, if you look at satellite images of the Pearl River Delta, you can just begin to open up the question of many layers and fabrics and vectors of urban agglomeration that are part of contemporary urbanization processes that are very hard to subsume under a generic notion of the city. Second proposition, and in some ways even more central to the work we're doing here in the Urban Theory Lab, is that urban agglomeration is not the whole story. In fact, we need to think urban agglomeration in a relational way connected to a variety of transformations outside of the city or the agglomeration, outside the big population centers. So just a few visualizations to give you a sense of what I have in mind. Some of these are from the 19th century, some are from the present period. So logistics infrastructures, rail traffic from a brilliant statistical cartographer named Minard in 1861. Um, telegraph cables, so the whole communications and transportation infrastructure of the world is part of the urban fabric, and of course contemporary submarine cables that make all of our smartphones and so much else operate are part of the, the weave of the urban beyond and among the cities. Also increasingly, urbanization is a large scale continental and intercontinental project. This is from Felipe Correa's studies in the South America project of the URSA in Latin America. So new very large scale projects of economic integration that involves huge that involve huge amounts of sunk capital and infrastructure, also creating a variegated, unevenly developed urban fabric across places, territories, regions, and scales. Contemporary debates about the environmental footprint of cities are yet another way into this, basically underscoring the point that urban consumption patterns hinge upon massive land use transformations in a so-called ghost acreage located often far afield. So we need to think the urban condition, not just via the city, but via a variety of urban transformations. And in a certain way, as my colleague at the ETH, Milica Topolovic, has argued, putting the city under eclipse such that we can see this urban fabric, these variegated conditions. And this brings me to a third proposition, which is a lot of my current work at the moment on the hinterland. So we need to develop, I want to argue, new frameworks for understanding new infrastructural, political, and spatial strategies that are emerging within the space that's traditionally understood under the rubric of the rural and, uh, and, and the hinterland. So I want to argue that in many ways, the hinterland is becoming a terrain of urbanization. The hinterland, in other words, is being urbanized, but not because in this traditional sense, it contains cities or big populations. Oftentimes, the hinterland is increasingly being depopulated through enclosure, dispossession, and displacement. But rather, the hinterland is being urbanized within this framework that we're developing because it's becoming an operational landscape. That is to say, it's being operationalized through industrial agriculture, industrial resource extraction, industrial forestry, industrial logistics in order to serve the um, urban way of life 
that is increasingly being generalized around the world. Just to give you a few impressions, this is the cover of one of our recent books in the Urban Theory Lab. You may recognize it's the Northern Alberta Tar Sands, a highly um, environmentally destructive landscape, obviously not a city, although it's close to a city, Fort McMurray in Canada, but I would argue we cannot begin to understand this condition if we classify it as rural or even just as the hinterland. It's an urbanized industrial landscape, but at the same time, and perhaps even more provocatively, I would argue that we can't understand our way of life in the big, dense megacities of the world unless we include this condition within our understanding of what cities actually are. So it's not just about look to the hinterland, look to the operational landscape. It's about how doing that changes the way we understand agglomeration itself. And a few other images from the same photographer who took the cover image of our book, Garth Lenz, and also um, so industrial agriculture. And this one is from Edward Burtinsky, who I think is pretty well known here, and also waste landscapes. So I've just got a few minutes left, and in the remaining time, I just want to give you a quick impression of the work that we're actually doing in the Urban Theory Lab, connecting um, our research agendas, our agendas related to theory development, to um, teaching and to a kind of research-oriented seminar that I um, teach every spring. And a lot of it is focused on visualization and using counter-visualizations of the dominant urban meta-narratives of our time as a basis for developing new theories. So we do this, as I mentioned, this studio or research seminar every spring, and we have an end of the semester kind of review in which we evaluate the work. And some of the work that we've done, which I'm gonna quickly summarize now, is also an exhibition which we took to Melbourne School of Design last spring, and which in a couple of days actually will appear in the Shenzhen Biennale. So just a quick, just some quick impressions of what this is all about. So here what we do is we critically interrogate another image or visual visualization, which is probably one of the most popular representations of the Anthropocene or of the urban age, and that's of course the nighttime lights map, a fascinating map. We see all of these lights and it's used as a kind of proxy for the urban condition. In fact, even in terms of the lights themselves, the map has been systematically scrubbed based upon meta-theoretical assumptions. So here's the unscrubbed version of Europe. It's pretty sprawling, there's a lot of light pollution, and they scrub it because there's an assumption that the city is bounded. You also might notice, this is work, by the way, by Nikos Katsikas, Tidez student here in the Urban Theory Lab. He, um, he's now put in red some of the areas that they deleted from the map, which are in the North Sea and um, various parts of um, the Mediterranean and elsewhere related to resource extraction activities that generate light pollution uh, and therefore need to be scrubbed out of the map because otherwise it doesn't mean what we want it to mean. And here's another classic. This is North Dakota in the box where a lot of the fracking is going on. So there's a lot of meta-theoretical moving, moving around on this map, even before you critically interrogate it. But even aside from that, a lot could be said about that. Even aside from that, what's most striking to us, given the framework we're developing within our lab, is that most of the map is empty. So as a kind of test case, and as an experimental strategy for our work, we decided to actually look at the empty spaces on the map, the supposedly empty spaces on the map and to see whether we could use our framework as a way to develop other visualizations of what's actually going on in these zones. So we looked at the uh, Pacific Ocean, the Arctic, the Amazon, the Sahara, the atmosphere itself, the Himalayas, the Gobi, Siberia. Exactly the zones on the map that appear empty, and it's been a long project, a couple years now, and we're trying to bring it to a conclusion basically looking at three issues that we think are central to global urbanization. Land use intensification, connectivity infrastructures, and socio-environmental transformation. And just by way of conclusion, I'm just gonna scroll through some of the images, the counter visualizations that we've produced, and even within about a week or two of starting this research seminar three years ago, immediately the map started to fill up with alternative ways of understanding the infrastructure, the fabric of urbanization. They're not empty at all. They're undergoing a process of infrastructuralization and operationalization connected to our current moment of planetary urbanization. So just in conclusion, let me just share with you the work that we've been doing and which is in our exhibition. So this is Gerga Basic on the Arctic. This is Ali Fard and Ghazal Jafari on the Arctic. 
So different issues related to resource extraction. This is several um, students and colleagues in the UTL, Danielle Ibanez, Ali Fard, the Amazon, a whole range of activities being infrastructural, infrastructuralized, operationalized. Um, Tamar El Shaya, Marianne Potvin, Danny Ibanez, and others. Um, resource extraction zones, infrastructural transformations in the Sahara. Vinit Dewadkar, looking at um, the kind of transformation of the Himalayas into a hydroelectric machine to fuel urbanization in both China and India. Um, Gurga Basic, again, looking at dust storms in the Gobi Desert and asking the question of the ways in which Beijing, as it were, is becoming Gobi to the degree that transformations in the Gobi are affecting and transforming urban life within the big city. Uh, the Pacific Ocean, Matthew Brown, a resource extraction zone, a highway corridor, a geopolitical, a zone of geopolitical conflict. More on the Pacific and still more on the Pacific. And then finally, just by way of ending, the atmosphere might seem like a crazy proposition. Back in 1903, Georg Zimmel argued that if uh, all of the pocket watches in Berlin were to stop simultaneously, the whole city would um, grind to a halt and fall into chaos. I would make the same argument today, except the relevant reference point is not the pocket watches. It's things like this, which are immediately connected to many di different layers of infrastructuralization and operationalization of the orbits. So um, Rob Dario, Melanie Park, um, and others uh, in our lab have been trying to visualize this as an urban space. Final point, and I'll stop. So the upshot of all of this for me is that the current condition of planetary urbanization, the cities matter a lot. They matter a lot. But the fundamental issue here about our current moment of planetary urbanization is not necessarily the cities themselves, but the ways in which all of these broader urban landscapes are being operationalized, infrastructuralized, and enclosed in order to support our current formation of urbanization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, for those fascinating words. And um, it just as a marker of my own antiquarianism, I referred to seminars earlier, but the term I should have used, and it's prevalent throughout the GSD, is laboratories. And that's a, a space we should probably discuss during the panel. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, um, uh, Beth Whittaker, who's going to speak about uh, her practice in architecture. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Neil. That is tough to follow. <laughs> so we're going to go from as big as it gets to um, talking about teeny tiny wooden dowels, um, and then slightly bigger. So uh, thank you for having me, Mosin, uh, and inviting me, and I'm thrilled to be here, of course. Um, I've been teaching Core Studios now for, I think, six years. Um, and I have a practice called Merge Architects here in Boston. So I just wanted to start um, by talking about how much I enjoyed Ed's discussion about the and versus the if, then, the as, all that. Because I am asking myself, full disclosure, every week, is it and? <laughs> is it with? And Gary and I were just joking we wake up and we're like, which one is which one is going to lead the day? Um, so the work at, at my practice, uh, and I've it, I founded it uh, in about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, what I enjoy with teaching, and my practice is here in Boston, so I'm not a New York architect that's flying um, here and there. I'm very much working in the city. Uh, not Neil City, but but the, the the urban city that I understand, the one that's f fully built, um, which is Boston, which is not easy. Um, and so there's been this really great feedback loop between the physical and the abstract, obviously, with teaching. Um, and what I love with uh, first year core studios, which is what I've been, um, for the most part, teaching. This year I'm teaching second year is really this getting these um, students that, yes, some have backgrounds, some don't, um, and trying to turn uh, very abstract ideas from an economical background, a mathematic background, a, a philosophy background into spatial, architectural, tectonic ideas. My practice is building. We've been building since day one. Um, and I'm going to show you quickly a series of very small projects, but I think 
I need to show you just enough so that you understand how, how, how we work and how I think it resonates with the students. So my background before the GSD, before I even, I was a grad student here, was an undergrad in a design school that had textile design, landscape architecture, architecture, um, graphics product, and there, so there were a bunch of 18, 19 year olds with all this raw talent, we were just making stuff. And that really planted the seed for me of how I work through my work. Um, I would describe my practice, if we're gonna try to, uh, in terms of where we traffic in this um, kind of big discussion of contemporary practice. Um, we're very much a high-tech, low-tech, kind of high-touch um, practice that's very uh, interested in the tactile. Um, so we're very interested in craft. Um, I would emphasize the low-tech. Uh, and because I think I like I like thinking about how to make things, but also because we have had these smaller projects to build a body of work. So we have had to find what I call the core project within the project. So we're not a practice that's been doing a lot of installations, um, temporary installations, which I am extremely interested in, but have rather treated our kind of normal program typology projects as permanent installations. So let me just kind of jump in. So, and what I do in the studios um, is to try to really bring, um, bring home this idea of thinking through making and developing through making. Uh, and that there has to be a bit of a um, huge amount of faith and leap, uh, especially in the first two years of CORE, to um, get these ideas out to actually explore and experiment with your hands and actually to see, turn around, and then kind of re-describe what you've done which is basically what we do in our practice. So the, this first small project, it's called the Peg Wall. Private uh, residential loft build out, super small. Um, and so I'm gonna try to just talk about the core project of each. We did a loft build out, the whole thing. But this piece of the project was just an extra room up on a mezzanine level. He, we wanted a second bathroom and a bookshelf. He had this big book collection. So we try to combine the two, and so we um, had this simple idea about um, these four by eight sheets of uh, plywood that we would CNC cut into this um, just grid of half inch uh, routed holes, and then insert 42,000 plus wooden dowels at different depths to create this undulating surface um, that would then therefore also become the bookshelf. So super small. We are also kind of a quirky design build shop. I've never actually put that on our website, but we um, not just design things that need to be handmade, uh, but we actually make them ourselves quite a bit. We are um, constructing a lot of the pieces on our project, so we may have a big union shop doing 95% of the project, and then Merge comes in and does the other 5%. Part out of necessity of budget, part out of, um, passion for actually getting it right, uh, and the people in Boston don't know how to build this stuff. So there is, we really are hands-on when I say we're hands-on. So this is a, a hidden door in the surface into this space within. Um, and I'm gonna try to go through these first few really quickly. But that's um, an idea about the core project as, as a wall, as a surface as a way of fabrication and very interested in how to make do with off-the-shelf products. So this one is very similar in a way in terms of taking these, this is a different uh, project. We were asked to design a prototype for a day spa um, by some interesting guys from Harvard Business School that have nothing to do with the pedicure industry, but they know how to make money. And they have now franchised, there are like 20 of them. Um, and we did the first four and we came up with the first one. And so we were tasked with uh, inventing a uh, kind of branding mechanism that would be scalable um, at many different spaces throughout the country. But the reason why I show this project, so these are four by eight sheets, similar to the last project, cut with this pegboard. But just by simply backlighting it, um, we have hybridized a program where it is actually rented out as an event venue in the evening, and they make the second source of revenue. So by very simple material strategies, we've actually kind of reinvented the program and choreographed a new way to use it. So, uh, another project, this is a, 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 a clinic of sorts. And what we, again, we had a GC build out the whole space. Um, and we focused on the wall in my office. We designed the whole space, of course, but we actually physically built this wall. And so this was um, an idea about a way of bringing light, if I can go back, 
to that image. Um, bringing light down into a two-story space that was windowless um, because of the way that it sat in the site. So we uh, uh, came up with this a way of um, uh, designing a series of CNC ribs and then wrapping it in a super thin polycarb um, surface with little rads and creating this kind of spatial divider that would actually grab the light and make the whole um, lower uh, space glow. And so pretty simple uh, CNC method with the ribs and then us, these are people from my office, actually making and assembling, fabricating, and then constructing. Okay. So um, last interior project, I think, uh, is a Lincoln Laboratory, uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, a fascinating company. They have like 6, 600,000 square feet out in Lexington. They are the go-to company for the government. They invent the radar system for our US military. They collaborate with MIT School of Engineering on what they call capstone projects. And if it gets legs, they take it out to the big boys out in Lexington. But they didn't have a physical space on the campus. And so they were losing all these incredibly bright students to Google and other, another client of ours um, because they had better spaces to work in. And so not only did they need a new space near MIT, but they, they invented a whole new entity, which is called Beaverworks. And so our challenge was to, in a very tight space, try to socially organize in um, three very distinct spaces. I'm not sure how this works. The laser, yeah. So this is a classroom. This is a lounge coffee area. And this is, believe it or not, a top secret, very secure wall here, space for Lincoln Lab, where they are um, uh, testing drones, sim simulated drones in real time in this corner. So like the FBI was at the opening party. So it was kind of a quirky project where it's just a lounge, um, it's a classroom, and then there's all this really cool top secret stuff going on that they do share with students. So this is a kind of a rapid prototyping um, fab lab of sort. There's a workshop down the corridor. So uh, what we, just again, there are a lot of things uh, that I could talk about with this project, but something as simple as these objects that divided the space and then socially choreographed these three zones in very distinct ways. So we, again, this is a piece of the project um, that we fabricated with Rad Lab on site and um, actually made and assembled um, for the project, which becomes a kind of room within the room where they have these very particular meetings. Um, and how we distinguish the spaces with some of these objects that kind of mix in with the kind of standard construction that you can see behind it, and then these more custom uh, components. So that's a little bit about, these, these are, we do furniture, we assembled these um, giant light scuppers for the, one of the spaces, and we make these in-house. And so, um, how we scale up. So, it's been tricky because we have been scaling up really fast in the last um, like 12 months. We've gone from that kind of work uh, to uh, multifamily housing. We, we have, I think we have seven multifamily housing projects in the office right now going up to 300 units. Everything from a nine unit building to a 300 unit building, we're doing a small hotel. And so we're trying, I'm trying to carry these interests from the smaller um, projects, of course, about craft and material and making, but also how we so socially choreograph, um, let me go back one, the spaces with regard to, in terms of multifamily housing, balconies and um, how it dialogues with the street. You know, you work with what you have. So um, with, this is a small uh, residential house, um, just 2,000 square feet. I'm only gonna show two images. But the big idea behind this house, it's just a box, it's, um, it's two stories, was that it has five recessed gardens, which are the green carves, um, that are inside the box. So it's an interior, it's an exterior space that kind of carves into the interior. And they provide these really interesting um, thresholds between the interior spaces, so like a bedroom and a bedroom, a bedroom and an office, a bathroom and a bedroom. And, but as you can see, it's under construction, it's almost complete, so this is a pretty rough image, but trying to really hold on to these um, interests in materiality and the expression of the material, and then how we incorporate uh, these kinds of social notches and pockets within um, the space itself. 
Uh, this is a, a schematic for a 300 unit housing project where we were looking at the um, different unit typologies, the studio, the one bed, the two bed, and three bed, and then how that would translate in an unfolded elevation, how it becomes a facade condition, how you express and deal with solar orientation as well as those unit types. So what we did is we um, have different ways of dealing with the pattern which are become more three-dimensional versus more two-dimensional and taut. And so what we ended up getting was on some of the surfaces um, these flat um, taut elevations and then this is actually the side that is uh, uh, holding the one bedroom studios so that we set up this social kind of staggered connection on these balcony conditions. So I hope that seeing this um, resonates with some of the early work. It does for me. <laughs> Even though it's a facade, I see the peg wall in this, um, in this facade and yet we're able to incorporate real life. It's a far more than a surface into these pockets. Okay. Um, okay, and then I think it's important that I show you some built work. This is, I know I just have a few minutes. This is a project in East Boston on a shipyard. Um, this is our site right here. Really amazing site because it's super gritty. It's so hard to do contemporary work in Boston. But we were adjacent to, flanked by this shipyard, which is all this yellow. This is our site. And these um, very um, uninspired triple deckers in East Boston. So we had a really good story of how we could gravitate toward the industrial um, uh, architecture of the shipyard. And the shipyard is this amazing place, there's our site, that happens to have amazing views of uh, Boston from its location. And then this added um, kind of culture of these art, art artifacts that are found throughout. So a really wonderful job, um, project to get. This is, a, this is our site right here where that dead tree is, which we took out. Um, and so it's essentially a box. And so what, what we charged this box with was, um, you know, what could we get out of it? Super low budget. So we wrapped it in corrugated steel, nothing remarkable about that. But what is, I think, really smart about the project is how we, and we were forced to do this, so how we had to stack nine tube units. We went with this tube typology, so floor throughs. And then we needed a cross grain um, second means of egress connector. So how do you cut off a unit in the middle of it? And so what that did is that forced us in section to go above and below this corridor so we get this split level unit. And I know I'm kind of geeking out on the housing thing, but it's really hard to deal with these two means of egress. We were at the zero zoning envelope. Um, and so there's even more to it than that. But this thing is packed in. And what happened was, what seems like um, we went as low as code would allow, seven and a half feet, which sounds horrible, but they open up to these voluminous double height living spaces, so it worked. In fact, I find them much more interesting than a flat. So dealing with these restrictions, my office has to deal with the reality all the time. Um, and, uh, and, and how it actually forces you to innovate. And then the other piece of the core project with this project is, I, um, is the facade. So again, thinking about all the things I've been talking about with the smaller work, um, gravitating toward the larger work, we came up with this system where we would identify each of the nine um, in a kind of more playful frame that we would, we call it shrink wrap, but would wrap in this um, mesh uh, netting, this Karstall stainless steel mesh from Germany, um, on, on these ribs, which became cables, uh, so that we would provide a kind of um, uh, kind of a, you know porous screen and, and translucence between the street and the the unit, and how we could start to explore different levels of depth behind it. This is a balcony, so how that becomes the threshold and the space caught between the street and the unit, how it. Um, how it then changes to just wrapping over the corrugated metal and so on. And so what, we were, what, what that afforded was this really great vertical garden um, on this super gritty concrete corner of the city. So the, the neighborhood really embraced it for that. Um, so just a little bit about the fabrication. We literally sewed this facade on. So we're back to the peg wall. <laughs> so a, a very dumb box built, you know, typical uh, design build. Um, or, or, or GC built, uh, and here we are sewing. We found a boat builder in a metal shop that would get on board. Um, it wasn't easy, 
And they literally with us sewed this facade onto these frames. Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, these, these uh, processes are not perfect. Um, this facade is not perfect. It's super safe, but it is not perfect in its construction and craft. But we, I am insistent that we bring this level of interest and investigation into all of our projects. I know it's going to be hard as we scale up, but so far so good. We're, and our client thought we were crazy. Every time there was a budget talk, this thing was on the table. And for me, this was the project. Uh, so I'm glad it's over. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then I think I just have one more. Um, how am I doing? Do I have a minute? Three minutes? So we are working through a series of schematics for a city in southeast China where they have asked us to look at an urban village and in particular to renovate, which, is, which sounds great. Um, but in big, but uh, it's a very small scale urban village, which is a very common condition. Um, within these mega cities that are surrounded by the high rise uh, scale. And so I showed them my work, I gave a couple of talks in January and it was surprising that they, it actually resonated, I was a little worried because it's the land of the, of the high rise, that this small and middle scale actually resonated with, with what they're dealing with some, with some of their urban villages. And so we just have a first pass at schematics where we've taken on this main intersection and they needed it to widen in some places and then some buildings needed to be demolished renovated, preserved, reconsidered, you name it. So we just um, have started looking at the context. There are a few ancestral halls. There's this um, incredible uh, social life that's sprouting up. They're starting to clean it up. There's all this great street life and kind of ad hoc appropriated program. Um, and again, the small scale, the intersection. So we have um, come up with a matrix of operations where we're carving down, we're taking out above, we're cantilevering out, we're cutting back, and so on. And so taking our um, approach to kind of small intervention, this is in this case just building a wall that then creates a little sculpture garden with these ruins, um, and then carving down more ambitious to create this amphitheater for street life. Um, and then also this whole, you can do it, you can construct it, um, temporary installation like uh, assemblies and kit of parts. So this is an idea about um, a kit of parts that they could put together and create these pop-up um, workshops throughout the street, uh, painting studios, painting class, um, different um, canopy conditions for art exhibitions, a flower stand, and so on. Pop up uh, library. So that's, I think that's kind of the scale that we're working at right now. Um, and then just to show you a couple of student projects, I just have like four, Ed, and then I'm done. Um, and how I try to uh, help them translate the abstract into the physical, and how I am very interested in, when I say physical, really talking about tectonics and plane and space. This is a, a beloved project that's no longer on the, on the uh, uh, syllabus for first semester core called the Lock Project, where we looked at kinetic um, mechanisms that we, we would then try and translate into actual architecture. Um, this was going to be a museum, so that was the mechanism. This was the mechanism translating to a museum. These are first semester students. Um, this is a similar mechanism that then translated into a, a theater building uh, on the lock. Uh, this is a student of mine from last year trying to discretize a program brief that we gave out um, to kind of equalize and then trying to think of a structural system and a kind of a conceptual system that would follow. And then how to turn something like this, which is about a kind of um, um, spatial adjacency, poetic and jambo we looked at, um, which is something Corbusier was interested in, and how to spatialize that into maybe a 2D, 3D graphic, a kind of 3D collage that then becomes a formal uh, proposal for a, in this case, a fitness center. How we rethink um, uh, typical programs like a house, um, we, do an, we used to do an eight foot wide house, which is something we're trying to do in our office, not an eight foot wide house, but how we rethink um, typical program typologies and invent within those systems. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Beth, for that lovely presentation and that uh, insight into dealing with the real, as you so nicely put it. Um, our next and final panelist will be um, Gary Hildebrand, who's a professor here in practice in landscape architecture and also a principal at Reed Hildebrand um, Landscape Architecture. And I just want to say very quickly at the, the luncheon today for the landscape architecture students, one of them was inquiring about the history theory sequence here. And one of the current students says, oh yeah, we do that all in Gary Helderbrand's studio, which is to say um, his incredible uh, attentiveness to the history of the discipline and to precedence, just to say that um, these areas' concerns uh, are never so well sequestered. They're very nicely brought together. Thank you, Ed. Very, very, very kind. This is the open cover of our monograph from uh, two years ago, and I um, sometimes have feel the obligation to unpack its title. I'll do a little bit of that um, this afternoon. This is um, one of my families. This is uh, photographs of our current office staff, about 40 landscape architects. I'm privileged to have three homes. Um, none of them is a vacation home. One is where I sleep or try to sleep, more try than sleep. Uh, this is the second one, that's our office in Central Square um, with its um, library replete with uh, about 3,000 volumes. Oops, sorry. And the third is this building, and uh, it's a privilege to have three. Um, this is about my firm. We um, try to align everyday life with visible phenomena and invisible systems of nature. Nature is largely invisible in my view. It's things you don't see. The second sentence I think is a little bit like marketing. We shape the land and the city. In doing so, we shape lives, build communities. That sounds like marketing. But the last thing is important to me, which is that we see sites for what they are and what they also might become. And we make, hopefully, this is the aim, this is the aspirational part. Hopefully what we do is some cultural consequence. I have five um, topics where I feel there is substantial overlap between my practice and teaching. The surface is alive, vegetal city, indeterminacy, visible invisible, and telescopic. The first one, the ground is a skin. Uh, like the skin on your hand, it has characteristics of integument and epidermis. It is a membrane, it's porous, it's pervious, things pass through it. And the world we inhabit above the surface of the city can't really exist without reciprocal, living, biophysical life below it. Um, I, I got that from Marty Feldman and uh, Mel Brooks, not really. But I, it did occur to me that this thinking about the city as something alive merges very nicely with this very scary, wide-eyed man. Um, it really came to me in thinking about the problem before us when we were commissioned to make what I thought might be an important urban place in Boston, and we really didn't know how. Um, but they knew how in the 19th century. Uh, in um, these two photographs by Ajay, you can see that um, really the surface of the city is made by hand and is actually an, something you can operate on. And certainly things pass through it. You can't have trees without roots. And uh, this little tamping machine is, uh, for me, a beautiful thing. So we made a place in Boston that we think of, I guess, as a kind of threshold project for us, really, a, uh, a touchstone, um, a living surface. Um, it looked like that. Um, and then it looked like the previous photograph. Uh, and the idea was that the surface was malleable and organic. Immediately below the surface was a zone of living material that would support trees, not for the seven to 10 years that they typically live in a downtown, but for generations. That's our aim, to grow trees for generations. You also have to be able to drive a fire truck over that surface. 
and I'm just going to explain how we make it. Now there's a whole bunch of spaghetti underneath it by way of utilities, you know, things that were there for years. This is landfill, by the way. It was in a, an estuary. It used to be the harbor. Um, this little diagram explains all of the things that hold up the surface. And these quick little studies show you the uniform surface of the ground, what's below the ground and as, as structure, that um, mass of living medium we call planting soil, or in this case, structural soil, which is provided at about a rate of 1,300 cubic feet per tree. Um, the surface is pulled very tautly to the trees, but as the trees grow, the surface can change. And if you think just about the blue lines as moisture, we pick up every drop of water on the site and we deliver it back to the trees through a system that I call life support. And if we have to drain it, we have a drain for it too. That's what it looked like the year it was built. We put very large trees in there. Today, these trees are nearly twice the, the size that they went in seven years ago. And that's um, where we learned really to have a commitment to doing that well. A corollary to that is a, my project called Vegetal City, which, is a, which began as a seminar last spring taught with my colleague, Sonia Dumpelman, um, where we're examining urban forest typologies, and which started really back in that day of building the Central Wharf, where I learned with students in another course that there was an entire science of urban forestry working on the urban canopy that had no connection whatsoever to the people who design and plant and build vegetation in our cities. And I think it's important to try to close that gap. And so that's what my current coursework in the advanced part of the curriculum is about. Um, these are Robert Polidori's photographs of Hurricane Katrina, famous photographs, which um, mark an event which made me very angry. Um, it exposed all sorts of evils and not the least of which is the idea that the urban infrastructure that cools the city and shapes it spatially could be destroyed in a couple of days. And what would you do about that? So our students turned to this urban forestry business and tried to um, illustrate um, matters of performance which were being gathered by mayors of cities around the country. And we came up with this this is sort of between the studio course and my office. We came up with this little formulation about life support. If you want to sequester carbon, if you want to shade up to 24 degrees cooler uh, the surface of the city, if you want to harvest all of the rainwater and manage it as stormwater, you can't really do it in any sustained way if you don't provide what's shown down here which is a certain amount of medium, a certain amount of moisture, irrigation, inoculation, and an infrastructure that supports the spatial world we inhabit above. And our office has continued this kind of research. And um, I'd always dreamed that our office would have a kind of research arm, and we've been managed to do it with the help of some scientists. I'll pass that and with the help of, uh, of a GSD intern from a couple of years ago who made these really great illustrations about um, what we design as an infrastructure below the living surface of the city. And this project originated from the simple question, could we go back now a few years later and determine whether or not those conditions were as we built them? or had there been some reversion. I won't go into the details of it. Well, I'll show you some slides of it. This is another project that we examined. It's a Christian Science Church, a plantation of 200 European linden, little leaf lindens that um, have all survived having been planted in cages, uh, those tubes that you see in the illustration, uh, in 1972. Every single one of those trees is alive and healthy. 
and we really wanted to understand why. And so we looked quite carefully at how those soils were performing. These are illustrations made by Stephanie, the intern, by the way, who is now an employee of the office. That's a peg, that's a plug. Um, and um, we looked at how these soils operate over time. What happens to soils? What happens to um, salinity? What happens to bulk density? And we were trying to make correlations to tree health. So we have concluded that study, and we've determined really that these soils largely perform as specified 10 years later, and we think that's good news. This is an illustration of how we think of the living surface of the City Hall Plaza in Boston. We're on our fourth contract. We haven't scratched the surface yet, um, but we have a, we're embarking now on a new project to reconceive City Hall Plaza along with five other city properties in what I think will be a very um, much smarter project than the failed ones uh, in our previous efforts. Back in the Vegetal City Seminar, we looked at things like this. Dominique Perrault's uh, Bibliothèque Nationale, which conceived of a pine forest in the middle of the city. <clears throat> is that a good idea? And is it even possible? Uh, so it's certainly, uh, from these photographs, you can imagine that the courtyard um, that's made by the formation of the building is not connected in any biophysical way, below grade at least, to any other living part of the earth. It's a terrarium, if you want. However, um, if you look at the ma this map, you can imagine that there is, in fact, a connective canopy in Paris, and that counts for a lot. What we've learned is that the pine, which is not shade tolerant and which was planted at a fairly high, a tall um, uh, size, are dying off quite quickly, being replaced by deciduous material. How is that happening? That's happening spontaneously from birds and wind. And that kind of transformation over time, that um, kind of spontaneous vegetation that is in some way going to replace that forest changes the conception of the building. My next subject, indeterminacy, we talk about it a lot. I'm trying to go very quickly here. Um, indeterminacy is a subject um, that is really, really worth talking about, but it doesn't mean that we don't decide things. It doesn't mean that we don't try to have control. We have, um, I think, the ambition to assert quite a lot of control over our landscapes. If you see our work, I think you would understand what I mean. But we're not in charge of nature, and nature's force is something that um, we have to work with. It grows back at us. Um, in the studio, uh, in the first semester core of landscape architecture, we talk about indeterminacy as a characteristic of the edge between land and water, which um, in the age of exploration and in depictions of the city has always been a, a, a kind of um, a starting point and a, and a crucial matter of how we describe, especially when navigation was principally done by water. We've uncovered this very interesting USGS map of uh, New Haven. We're working on a project at Yale University, uh, which also describes New Haven as a delta. Now, I think if you just have to squint your eyes to understand where the estuary used to be and where it is today. Does anybody who lives in the flats of New Haven think they live in an estuary? Probably not. In the course, the first semester course, we talk about surface and edge as field conditions that are and will be indeterminate. And I'll just pick the bottom um, definition here that, um, to say that in landscape architecture, we can speak about indeterminacy as a quality of open-endedness, of contingency, and of, in some ways, undecidability. And these concepts have been put forward um, by two members of our faculty, Anita Beraspetia and Charles Waldheim. And these photographs by Sugimoto describe another kind of edge condition, that between land, uh, sorry, between water and sky. So many different ways of understanding 
that edge condition, surely indeterminate. These are drawings of the waterfront uh, of the project for the, from the first semester. These are hand-drawn charcoal drawings done by students who largely did not draw before they entered the course seven weeks prior. And these are studies of the geometricization, uh, the tiling and um, uh, platting of the edge condition, topographic conditions. Um, this is again probably week 10, where a student probably had never used a contour before the beginning of that semester. Um, understanding the role of the tide, the diurnal condition of the tide and the seasonal aspects of that, and trying to model that. What you're looking at here is a kind of mylar representation of the high tide with land coming up above it. You might explain it, you might understand it a little more clearly here. A topographic condition in which is never the same twice, it's always in variation. And then we move to other forms of representation to try to capture the material qualities and conditions of the surface. The experiential, all in the first semester. Um, this is convenient for me, this is the overlap, because we've worked in the seaport for quite a long time and at the moment we are proposing to rebuild Pier 4, which is next to the ICA. The site that we just saw is right here. So, you know, that overlap is convenient. I don't want to confuse what I do in my practice with what I do in my teaching, but the overlaps are really, um, really productive for us. We have fantastic um, uh, material to start with for the students. Our idea here is to rebuild a pier um, by understanding failed and found conditions most clearly and to make a landscape out of that. A more, uh, an example that I want to go into in a little more depth is, is one on the Hudson River. That peninsula, the second peninsula that you see, is a completely um, man-made peninsula. A bucolic place that also looks like this on a heavy rain. Pretty tough place. This is, of course, before our project. It has a checkered history of being first a pier, a dock, then a railroad bed, a siding, then a gas holder site, then a, an automobile wreckage place, and then finally, in four phases of work over a 10-year period, we've begun remediating and building a new landscape here, which has buttresses to protect the site. Uh, this is a grading model study for the buttresses and the intertidal zone uh, from debris. And then when you go to build this, rising tides really feels like it's hitting home. Uh, this is during one phase of construction. And what we found is that, you know, another form of indeterminacy here is the fact that because this is essentially a piece of land made of rock, very porous, the tide, when it's super high, comes up through the land. And so we have both inundation this way and upwelling this way. This was a kind of an extreme place, but it, you know, it was a kind of setback for us. Another setback, we were building the final phase of this during Hurricane Irene. Um, the entire site flooded, that was tough, but in fact the buttresses worked. And that, um, that proved to us that our ideas of resiliency on this site, which we'd worked really hard on, uh, were in fact plausible and sustainable. Uh, it's now matured, this is, these are photographs from last year. And um, you know, it's become a complex landscape, one of um, already maturing vegetation, strongly working wetlands, and very high use in Beacon, New York. The title of the book is really about the fact that our experience is shaped more by things you don't see than by things that you do. What don't you see? You can't see the underlying structure. You can't see the life support system. You can't really see what's happened previously on a site. You can't see nature's force. You can't see what we erased, what we took away. Uh, you can't see what we blocked out. And you can't see what's beyond your cone of vision. Um, we're going to very quickly go through this project at Marsh Court in England, uh, a fantastic house by Sir Edwin Lutyens with a garden by Gertrude Jekyll. 
a house made of chalk because chalk is the site. There's flint here also, and there's also brick. You can make brick because there's clay. And so this house is beautifully executed out of those three materials alongside this ancient copse of oaks. We know that the site has this ancient copse because it's well recorded in, in uh, uh, the uh, land ordinance surveys. You can see the location of the chalk pit. The house ended up right here. Lutchen's plan is a very beautiful exposition of this surface condition. Drive in and go up through a massive cut through chalk, a long drive that was also cut through chalk, which allowed you the vivid experience of these ancient hazel and oak trees, and then arrival at the house, which was a big lodge. There's the, 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 um, the driveway in the flat. This is extreme. This is, you can cut chalk almost vertically, and it'll stay there. And over time, it can be vegetated. So it's actually 30 feet at the, at the deepest there. Over time, the driveway, which had also been cut from chalk, had been what we call sanded down. That wasn't the condition that we thought should remain. There was no longer the kind of beautiful drama of surprise driving up there. We said we should put that back. We should put the chalk cut back. And so the beautiful thing about chalk is you can cut it, and also you can pack it. It, it compacts very well. So in fact, that's what we did. So contractors thought we were crazy out of our minds to make slopes like that. But of course, they already were there. They existed. And so now we've restored, in a way, that kind of very taut passage, which made the journey from the big cut up the drive to the house quite significant and special. Looks like that this past summer. Another quick one here. We had this photograph from Lawrence Weaver's book of the tennis courts. It had been sanded down like the other. We said, well, let's put that back. We got out the work. Crazy steep. And now we have it really in that kind of. So we're dealing here a little bit with cultural patrimony. It's a question of a very a grade one listed building in the UK, which really should be treated in a curatorial way. And um, so that's, uh, in fact, the charge in a, in a sense. But we also have the obligation to carry that work forward. And so we have also been producing our own interventions out here a little bit further away, which um, I'll just show this one image of um, a grove of 100 beech. So hopefully in 300 years, there will be another ancient copse that we've planted. And um, someone else will probably put a driveway through it. <laughs> Um, the last issue is that of um, the telescopic. Scale knows almost no boundary in landscape architecture. For me, this is now more a personal, like my personal corner of the room, um, small scale matters as much as the large. I'm gonna, just going to go right to these images here um, and close on something about making a real landscape, um, one that was in a quarry. Uh, which took us about four years uh, with a lot of time on site, um, using as much of the stone in the quarry as we could, tailings, really waste stone, and not bringing any stone in from outside. Jetty walks. Um, this is a house by Tony Smith, which has been beautifully restored um, by the architect. Um, and uh, in a sense, we felt that we were trying to reorder the refuse of this quarry into a usable, um, spatially interesting, and compelling seaside home. I'll stop there. Uh, actually, I want to say one thing about this image. Um, because another part of the relationship between practice and pedagogy is writing. And I was asked recently to write an article about a project that has uh, just been recognized as having 50 years of um, growth and beauty, a project by Dan Kiley, the landscape architect at the Art Institute in Chicago. I wrote the piece. What I discovered here is something that um, 
I wonder whether Kylie had thought about. You are absolutely under a carpet of vegetation here, and there is really nothing quite like it. And the reason it happens is that hawthorns, which can only grow so high, can keep on growing by extending their branches. And while they're 40 feet apart, 30 feet apart, they have actually grown together as a single mass of vegetation. Now, the tree is not shade tolerant, and so there are no leaves on the undersides of the branches, and that is also something that produces that pattern. This just comes from critically, look, critically looking at the urban vegetation, which is a thing that's very important, both in my practice and my teaching and my writing. Thank you. refreshments that are awaiting us. So I thought we'd keep the, uh, the panel brief. And I think the, um, the educated consumer chooses the graduate program based on the luncheon and the refreshments. So I won't keep you from them. But um, I just had two general comments. And um, one is a pairing of uh, Neil's uh, remarks and Gary's. And then I have a slightly separate issue with uh, Beth. And, what I want to say, Gary, was you um, had an earlier comment. You said um, the, the question of what might become, and then the issue of indeterminacy, and yeah, it's beautifully exemplified with the uh, Kylie um, Garden. I was curious to the extent to which you can apply that um, to students, and that students who are in a Baumschule, we're in a little nursery, if you will, we're raising these, these shoots, and it's an indeterminate yet guided process. And um, so just put together some of the themes you see in the world of landscape and what takes place in the studio uh, classroom. Um, and I wanted to pair that uh, with uh, something Neil said earlier. He, he began his uh, discussion talking about the resistance to theory, which I thought was a very provocative phrase. And again, Putting this in the frame of uh, practice and pedagogy, what immediately came to my mind was that uh, essay by Leotard where he speaks about the resistance to theory, but not as the students don't want to engage in theory. It's the idea that things in the world kind of check us. You know, you have to kind of kick the tires, and they, they offer resistance to our theories. So there's always that process, what we're learning in this room, these classrooms, these laboratories, there's a world out there where they're going to be tested somehow, and that process is back and forth and largely indeterminate. And I thought maybe you guys would want to um, elaborate on those issues. Well, is it still, this is on, yeah. I mean, great um, point, and I totally agree with this, um, this way of thinking about it. I mean, for me, theory is a project to grasp an historically changing geography. And so I agree with the kind of, whether it's leotard or whatever the position is, that there's this hyper complexity of life that we human beings can never fully grasp. And that might be an ontological condition. I mean, we can debate about that. Part of my commitment is that the built environment and the unbuilt environment, I think this is maybe a shared proposition for all of our different practices, it's constantly changing. I mean, every, all of us are concerned with the historicity of the sites that we think about and that we try to influence. And that's part of the practice of the different kinds of work that we do is to reflect on that historicity as we design our intervention, whether it's a built form, a landscape, or a conceptual apparatus. But just on the level of conceptualization, that, that is a foundational commitment for me. The whole reason why I think it's so important to constantly critically interrogate our interpretive framework is precisely because the world is changing. If you think of theory simply as a static set of principles or in a static interpretive grid, it can't really um, adequately grasp, however imperfectly it attempts to do so, the constant changes um, that are going on in the world. So the, the reinvention of the theoretical apparatus or the interpretive apparatus is as important as any other kind of more technical or instrumental uh, innovation, I think, that we might develop in order to confront the challenges of design. 
And I'm sorry, Gary, just one last thing. Um, Neil, as I alluded to this earlier, could you share with our guests uh, a little, just the, the notion of the laboratory, your own laboratory, but this space of the laboratory within the uh, GSD? Because uh, just talking about boundary conditions, uh, labscapes, landscapes, cities, hinterlands, what have you, and the role of theory, practice, pedagogy in those types of spaces. Well, I mean, there's a more general metaphor about the lab that I think your question alludes to, but just on a more pragmatic level for um, prospective students to understand, we have a number of different platforms and laboratories and venues in the school within which a variety of different research and design interventions are elaborated. So my kind of project that I was talking about, the Urban Theory Lab, is one among a whole set of different options and all of them are kind of constantly evolving and constantly developing within a sort of broader um, organizational umbrella. In terms of our um, urban theory lab, the model is basically that every springtime we do this kind of research oriented seminar together in which we spend some time getting familiar with some of the broader theoretical uh, uh, frameworks that we're trying to interrogate, and then we do sort of a research project, which in turn then spirals into subsequent um, kinds of research projects. So it's a lab in that sense of a kind of collaboration between faculty and students to um, work together both pedagogically, but also in terms of broader ambitions. I think indeterminacy gives us, in especially it's the case in the first year studio, but hopefully that is a sustained thing. Um, a kind of, for me, a beautiful tension between um, the uh, aspiration to be highly speculative and imaginary, imaginative, um, to imagine something that isn't there today, that doesn't erase exactly um, histories and also conditions that we find there today. Um, the tension between that and the absolutely truism the absolute truism that the regulatory world, the political world, and nature do not really allow us to exactly predict the future of the thing we imagine. And, and I, I love that space. That, uh, to me, is a wonderful place to teach. And I think it, I, I, I hope it's the case that it's exciting for the students to enter a conversation about landscape through that kind of spectacular tension. Yeah, I don't want to sound geeky to use <laughs> Beth's phrase, but uh, it, it made me think that um, we were talking about pedagogy, and um, one of the things we discussed in my class is the idea of um, orthopedy, which, you know, pedia is the same word, but for orthopedics, the, the image is the straightening of a tree, right? You bind the tree to make it grow straight, and, you know, which is part of the education of these things things which grow according to their own sap. So it's, it's, a, it's a lovely dialogue that takes place there. Um, uh, Beth, I want to bring you into this discussion. Um, and I, I, I liked very much your evocation of interiors. And um, since uh, Gary mentioned Young Frankenstein, thank you very much for that. It, it made me think of the, um, you know, the, there was this Woody Allen film called Interiors, which had to do with, you know, psychotherapy, with the life that's lived inside here. And I was very curious in the way in which these early projects provided this interior, in a sense, a, a kind of a lab or a studio of your own while you were engaging in practice, you were engaging in real constraints in the world, the, the messy idea of making, you still had carved out a space, an interior for you to uh, pursue your practice uh, in your own um, technique. And I was curious, maybe you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. So um, it's interesting to talk about in determinacy because I'm trying to think how does that because I know you didn't include me in that question but I think that's okay you know I've got another one now <laughs> but um, but it's interesting to think about that in the context of I think this is a little different than what you guys are talking about but in the context of representation in studio and I think somebody said today about constructing these fictions right and so there is this with regard to the student work, it's all fiction, right? And, it, and the representation of it is so strong because that allows for, you're talking about this in terms of history and time changing things, but I'm thinking about it in the context of representation changing the reading of the same project or the same discussion. Um, so with my work, it's, 
it's funny because there it, there isn't a temporariness to it like an installation because I'm building it hoping it will stay but we are we are often um, constructing it as we go so we very often are not drawing a full set of uh, rock solid details for some of these pieces that we're working on we are so that that's another <laughs> another way to fold into the conversation um, so yeah, I don't know if that's uh, so. I think that those sites in in our my practice, the core project, um, those are indeterminate in many ways <laughs> because of how we actually work through them, and that's why that's why I talk so much with my students about just d diving in. It's not about throwing everything you can against the wall and seeing what sticks. It's about understanding it and inventing simultaneously with making. And I think that that is kind of a fantastic way to sort of think about this word in the context of the studio. I, I could just add that, um, yeah, I was very taken with the idea that you wouldn't completely build a set of instructions. Don't tell my clients that. No, I just think this is alternative uh, and um, courageous. But I liken it to what we were doing in the quarry. I mean, we didn't really have an inventory of what we were going to be making with. And so we would pull it out of the tailings piles and say, what will we do with this? And I've never had that kind of joy before. I mean, it's always a joy to plant. It's always a joy to plant. But, um, but, but it was really fantastic um, to play with rocks. And this client really trusted us to do that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm curious about how each panelist wrestles with the and and with to lead the day. I, I thought Ed's um, introduction was, was really brilliant in that way because it really does break apart for us, um, you know, separating ways of thinking about relationships between practice and pedagogy. As I said to Beth earlier uh, today when, Beth, when Ed was talking, um, it's really the case that some days you get up and say, which one will suffer today? Um, so I liked all of the v versions, and um, I can't imagine my life without either or. So it actually becomes the either or, and the and, and the or, and what was the as if? Yeah, beautiful. You know, <laughs> um, it is true. I was careful not to say the word "suffer" up there. I felt a little anxious about it. You know, it's, we're here. We're here now. We're here it's today. True. <laughs> but it is true. It is. Um, there's an impossibility to what we do as practitioners and academics, and yet you get to the end of the day, <laughs> and often great things have happened, and then you go on to another day, and so it's. Um, it's a constant struggle. I mean, I don't want to get too personal about it. Um, <laughs> but I think the, the, the practice and pedagogy, it often feels, um, given, on a given week, week um, completely intertwined or completely disconnected. And I, I go through a lot of guilt about that, depending on the week. Um, I also am marvel at how, when I'm in one place, I can forget the other, which is dangerous. Um, and so there's a constant uh, gear shifting um, that I think is extremely productive, although extremely difficult. Um, but I am certain that, and we're all doing it, the wonderful thing about the GSD, and I would say most, most any serious school in architecture, landscape, theory, we all have a similar life, which is full. Um, and I think we all embrace it uh, in very positive ways that um, hopefully um, you know offer something to the student body. So I I couldn't see it any other way. I think you said I, I, what did you say? Something like I can't remember exactly. You threw another word in. Not either or. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're completely enmeshed. Um, 
Perhaps if I could um, conclude on a, a, a sentiment that was drawn by uh, Gary started off with a very beautiful image saying I have three homes except the country house, but we'll remedy that. Um, but um, it, it made me think if there's a, a site nearby, many of you will visit once you get to Cambridge, uh, um, Thoreau's little um, cabin at, at, at Walden. And he had this beautiful expression. He says, um, I have three chairs in my cabin, one for, a solid, for a solitary life, two for company, and three for society. Would you say this tiny space makes itself amenable to these different types of sociability and thinking? And uh, when Gary City has three houses, they're separate, but they're also one. We bring all these as aspects of our lives together in uh, the GSD, and I, I hope you've uh, seen facets of that today. So thank you very much for my panelists. I'm enormously happy to have you as my colleagues, and thank you all for joining in this uh, panel and coming to GSD today. <laughs>